what I have here is the capstan motor out of my uh, Tascam 112 Mark II and the job today is making a new motor pulley for this. This one has some problems. Uh, number one, it's no longer circular, it's elliptical and that happens as a result of uh, plastics shrinking over time. They shrink because they cure during their whole lifetime and especially if they have a steel shaft or an arbor, uh, they'll shrink around that and that's why a lot of cracking is seen and so forth. But what I want to do is I want to try and stabilize the uh, rotational inertia of this motor a little bit and there's not much weight on this plastic so there's no mass to really help the motor uh, reduce that kind of ratcheting effect that DC motors have. So what I'll do is uh, I'll remove this. Oh, the other problem I wanted to mention, which was uh, very interesting, was that it has a the casting marks from the original mold on both sides, and I can't show those because I've uh, already sanded them off. But it had the mold marks on it, and they were quite pronounced very surprisingly and that's you don't want that on your on your motor pulley you're trying to do everything possible to make that as uh, stable as possible and to reduce the wow and flutter and so that's that's what I'm doing here um, the other thing that I'll be doing is some very uh, vintage techniques on the manufacturing of it and I'm going to kind of back into this video do the uh, show the results first and then the process of doing it later not everybody's interested in watching uh, machining technique but this might be kind of interesting because I do use some old-school uh, manufacturing techniques so that's the job at hand and uh, let's get on with it Of course, first thing I need to do is determine the radius of the factory pulley. And uh, I've got that set up in the optical comparator. And it's looking to me like it's on the 515 thousandths line. Very close to it. Maybe just a little bit different, but very close to it. And what I'll do is I'll double check that using uh, coordinates and then calculate the cord length. What I come up with is over the length of 250 thousandths, I come up with a cord of a 15 and a half thousandths. And that comes up in my calculator to about about 512 thousand so very very close to our 515 I'll get that set up in the mill I'm using a piece of uh, high carbon ground flat stock Sterrett brand I think What I'll do is I'll face that off. And then I'll mill it to width. I've selected an end mill that is a radius of 516 thousandths, I believe. Might be 518. but it's one I already had ground to that and it will be it'll be close enough
Okay, that should get me there. Now I've already established my fixed jaw as the zero point. So I'll take a five degree angle block and that's what I'll use to shim up and give my clearance angle. I should mention this is the tool bit that's going to cut the radius. So I'm doing the profile on the tool bit And then because I already know the diameter that the cutter, the end mill, will cut, and I know my zero point on my inside jaw, that's my reference, I know how far I need to move in the Y direction to center the end mill on the workpiece. And it's basically an eighth of an inch. So if this end mill is the correct diameter for what I want to cut, and I'll go in there and just make a nice little radius on the end of that tool bit. There are a number of different ways to do this. That's the, yeah, so it's a 518, 518 thousandths radius, which is very close to my target of, uh, what, 512. There's how it turned out. Now what I want to do is very lightly hone, uh, sand, however you want to call it. And I'll do that by using a piece of 600 grit sandpaper on a one inch arbor. And you can see there that gives me 513 thousandths radius. And I'm just touching it. I just want to get rid of the mill marks before I go to the next step. This is my cutting edge. I want it to be sharp. Okay, so off camera, I offhand ground the clearance angles on the side. The relief angle and the clearance angle both on the side this is all done by hand i have i don't know a dozen grinders in the shop i think one of them has tool rests on it after 30 or 40 years of of offhand grinding a guy gets a feel for what he's doing and that was just done by hand so I have put another red mark on the ends there. You can just barely kind of see it. And I'm just grinding down or honing down to that, that red mark, trying to kind of leave it there. And there it is. You can just kind of see it on the tip. And that's all I'm doing is just taking it down to the point where I have almost nothing left on that that red sharpie mark. So what it comes down to is I'm not affecting the grind or the angle. I'm just getting it close to where I want it. I generally call that a witness mark. Uh, my lubricant here is Windex. Try it. Okay, I do the face last. So this is still in its soft condition. 
And what happens now is hardening and tempering. What I'm trying to do here is use a propane torch to heat this up red hot because I don't want to drag in my acetylene from the from outside. And I'm trying, 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 and it just it just doesn't have the heat to do it. But I keep trying. Eventually it probably would, but I don't have enough patience to wait for it. This is the process of hardening the steel, um, heating it red hot, holding it there for an amount of time, and then quenching it while it's in that red hot condition. I actually changed tanks here because the other one was pretty low, and I, I keep trying. If I'd have just gone outside and done it there to begin with, it would have been better. But I, I thought it could heat this little bit up here, but boy, I just can't do it. So eventually I wise up and uh, just take the piece outside and get the job done. Anybody keeping track, this is a slightly carburizing flame. Uh, it's meant to not overheat it and remove carbon from the steel. I'm using the carbon to do the heat treating. So I get this to a cherry red hot. This is a very old technique and it works beautifully. All I need is the very end of this hardened. I don't need the whole shank hardened, especially for cutting brass. It's not a not an issue. So I'll get it to that red heat, quench it in oil. This is oil hardening tool steel. And at this point, this is kind of what we call glass hard. It's extremely hard, but it's also very brittle. So I want to take the scale off of it, um, mainly so I can brighten up the steel and see the colors as I temper it. A lot of different ways to do this. The lap was already in the vise, and so I'm just doing it this way. Again, this is just a descaling operation. I'm not doing any honing or sharpening here. I just want to see the bright steel so I can see the colors run when I temper it. Yeah, that's plenty good. So now the propane torch is sufficient for this job because all I'm doing is heating up the shank and then allowing the heat and the oxide colors to run to the tip. What I'm looking for is a light to medium straw color on the tip and then I'll quench it again and stop uh, the flow. So there it is. That's a very, very, very light straw color. Starting there. So keep going. I've actually got the torch set up now and I'm 
doing it. It's not visible. But there it is. And you can almost watch the colors start to go north to the cutting edge. Just a little bit more, a little bit more heat. It's a little bit closer. I just watch it. I've got good light here so I can really judge the colors. And the minute I think that has hit, I quench it. That will provide me a cutting edge that is hard, but also not so hard that it's brittle. So that's drawing back the temper to a point where it has both hardness and uh, toughness. Now this is following honing. I've got a nice edge on it now. I've marked the radius on the tool bit so I always know what it actually is. And then that's for the archaeologists. So I'm boring the two millimeter uh, bore on the new pulley. This is also a tool bit I made. This is a 70 thousandths or about what 1.8 roughly millimeter and using the same technique on that. Um, hardening and tempering with oil. I'm setting the edge of my tool bit. This actually works really well. And I know that I need about a 40 thousandths flange or about a one millimeter flange. And I need to back that off about five thousandths. So I want to come in about 45 and leave myself five to clean up the edges with the um, profile bit. So I come in 35 and I just rough this out quickly as I can. Uh, sorry for the camera weeble wobble here. I think I had the uh, image stabilization set to on and I meant to have it on off. All right, let's rough this out. Never hurts to double check. Already got my stop set, so I know where I should be. And I use my compass scribes here, but they're a little too fat to do this job. All right, let's try the right tool. This is a woodworking technique, but it works on works on metal also. In fact, this is very much a woodworking technique. Yeah, 
Yeah, it was a little too fat for a conventional micrometer. Or I'm a little too thin. So I'll grab a blade mic. See where I need to be. Get that profile bit in the holder and and I'll indicate this in because I know that I milled the profile perpendicular to the shank. I know that if I set up the shank parallel to the cross slide travel, the tool bit will present itself perpendicular to the workpiece. We'll set the tool height. This is a little tool I saw someone showcase on YouTube, actually, and built one. Uh, brilliant, brilliant way to set up tool height. And do the same thing here. This actually works really well. It's surprisingly accurate and repeatable. But you do have to buy a lot of rules because they wear out quickly okay we'll set it over 40 thousandths or close to one millimeter Now we get to see how we did on our profile. Cutting well, not a problem. Got a good finish on everything. See where we're at. Slow that down just a little bit. Uh, slow the RPM down. Yeah, that didn't really work out so well. Let's uh, let's grab a different one. There we go. Just got a couple thousandths here to go. Just a little bit too narrow for my traditional mic, so I'm using a blade mic on this. Alright, let's get a nice diameter on it. And I've already determined that somewhere in the 5 8 range is correct for this. Just chamfer the edges and we'll give it a quick polish here. This is uh, the uh, non-metallic steel wool uh, that won't embed itself in the brass. pretty much spinning this at top speed. Mm. 
set the edge, come over the amount that I need. I think it was about three eighths. I'm obviously making these flanges or the ends of the pulley much larger uh, in diameter. I'm trying to achieve as much weight as I can on this pulley. And just touch up the outside corner. And there it is. Need to deburr the bore, and I have a pulley. There's the new one and the old one. Size difference. Let's get this mounted. Of course, it's an interference fit. Um, half a thousand, somewhere in that range, maybe four tenths. It really doesn't need a lot. There's not that much uh, force on this. But this is really ensures as concentric uh, a pulley on this shaft as can be. Any other method has slop. This is this is really a nice way to do it. You can see I've got kind of maximum diameter I can there. I could have made the outside larger, I suppose. I don't think it would have mathematically worked out and gained very much. Here's a comparison to the old one. It may not look like a whole bunch, but it actually is. It's a lot. In just a second here, I'll weigh it and show exactly how much difference there is in mass. Now the old one weighs uh, 0.53 grams and the new one weighs 5.97 grams that's over 10 times the mass and what that translates to in terms of angular velocity I don't know but it is an amount and the results I'll show in the next video and um, I hope you join me thanks for watching